Thanks a lot uh, for being here today with us. Uh, it is a great morning here from Utrecht. Of course, Werner is in Germany, so we're going to do this talk uh, quite remotely. And of course, thanks a lot to, uh, for uh, the invitation um, to, from, from JCon uh, organizers. In the meantime, uh, let me just pull my screen. So let me start sharing my screen to also kick it off for today. Great. So it's here. What are we going to talk about today? No SQL endgame, right? So first of all, let's meet. Werner, who are you? Yeah, I'm the current Jakarta EE specification committee representative of the community and the committers. I also have my own company working for various clients. Uh, at the moment, it's more on the desktop side, but this varies from time to time. So I cover almost everything from small embedded devices to large servers and clusters in the cloud. Great. Also a short uh, intro about myself. My name is uh, Fodoris Bais or Fodoris Bais in English. Uh, Greek by origin, living and working in the Netherlands for the last five years. Uh, I'm the founder and leader of the Utrecht Java user group. And uh, I'm working as a scrum master at the ABN AMRO Bank. Speaking of which, uh, just one marketing slide as well for uh, the developers today. Uh, we are hiring nowadays, uh, also uh, given that we are uh, slowly migrating and moving towards uh, the sustainable fut and future-proof bank, we do have some openings. So feel free to have a look at our website. And uh, if you are interested in any of the vacancies, feel free to drop me a line as well. Enough about uh, marketing. We are not here for marketing today. Uh, it is 2020. We had quite a tough year. And uh, let's uh, start off by having a look at uh, the five main trends of this year, right? So first of all, we had quite, or we, we do have quite some customers who are going online nowadays. And of course, most importantly, the internet is connecting everything nowadays. Third trend for 2020 is that big data is getting bigger and bigger, right? And of course, another trend, trend is that uh, more and more apps are moving to the cloud. So yeah, it speaks for itself, I guess, that uh, our world has gone mobile. And what does this mean actually for today's talk? It means that new digital trends create new technical challenges. And I'm pretty sure you might be wondering already, what are those technical challenges? So yeah, the technical challenges are of course, to develop with agility, to operate at any scale and to deliver the performance and availability required to meet the demands of digital economy businesses. We do have the term no SQL in our talk, right? So what are the advantages of NoSQL? First of all, it handles large volumes of data at high speed with a scale out architecture. Second of all, it stores unstructured, semi-structured, but also structured data. Third advantage of NoSQL is that it enables easy updates to schemas and fields. Fourth one, and most important one for us, it is developer friendly. And of course, it takes full advantage of the cloud to deliver zero downtime. Why this talk though, right? Why did we try to put everything together in, uh, in one hour session? As we all know nowadays, JVM can cope easily with heavy loads. However, there is a bunch of persistence frameworks out there. And of course, here comes the question, which one performs best for your own case? It would normally take ages for someone to compare all the available Java persistence frameworks for NoSQL, so we did it for you. Now, NoSQL, what, what this is all about? Of course, it is a database which doesn't use 
neither any structure nor a transaction. It is based also in the base concept uh, for which Werner will, will tell you more about as we speak. And it supports four different types of storing data as well. With that, and speaking of base and the rest of uh, key features of uh, the NoSQL databases, I would like to hand it over to Werner, who will uh, guide you in the main aspects and features of NoSQL databases. So, oh, just one second. Do, do you see the screen already? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the first type is a uh, key value with some uh, quite popular examples like uh, the Amazon storage, uh, Redis, or Hazelcast. Then there are column-oriented databases. Cassandra is probably the most uh, well-known, but there are also Apache, HBase, and several others. Document store uses some form of document, uh, usually a text document, uh, either XML or more commonly used uh, JSON with Couchbase, MongoDB, and the open source uh, Apache CouchDB as the three most popular examples. And then we have graph databases with Neo4j, InfoGrid, and several others. They're actually uh, the one that is most sophisticated because you can also model the relations between objects, as you see in this example. And then there's the shapeshifter, if you want, uh, the multi-model, which covers more than one, even in the same database, if you want that. So there are various acronyms uh, in SQL. You know, uh, table, row, column, and relationship. With key value, it's called bucket, and a key value pair. With column, uh, that's more or less closer to SQL. So you have the key value pair, but you also have column and column families. In documents, uh, it's all about uh, collections and documents. You can also link to documents, so it's more like the World Wide Web. And in graph, you have uh, a node, a vertex, uh, and edges. There are also two major principles of base, uh, basically available, soft state, and eventually consistency and ACID, which stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. In the CAP theorem, you see that uh, various systems uh, lie in one or several of these circles. And you can also look at different uh, database types uh, by how scalable they are compared to how complex they are. And here you also see that key value, column and document followed by graph, which is the most complex one. In a traditional relational application system, you have a logical tier, a data, access object, and then various different uh, JDBC drivers. They can all be accessed through JPA, which makes them quite compatible and interchangeable. So it's very easy to change from DB2 to Oracle, 
to Microsoft, MySQL, or the other way around. With NoSQL, that's not so easy because most of the APIs are very different. So how we try to compare them? First of all, we looked at Spring Data, Micronaut, Jakarta NoSQL, and Hibernate. And we'll also have a quick look at GORM uh, used inside Micronaut. So it's one of three different ways to access NoSQL databases in Micronaut. And we are going to look at Neo4j, MongoDB, and I think Hazelcast is not here, but for the sake of simplicity, we are not going to run Cassandra because that's a little more complex. Uh, so we chose Hazelcast because that's quicker and easier to demonstrate. So out of the four different types, uh, we are going to demonstrate three of them. So JPA is usually not so easy to apply to NoSQL. But you can apply certain general aspects of it, especially the annotated entities, which are common to almost every solution. And also various annotations. Sometimes they are common to a particular solution, especially in Jakarta NoSQL or Spring Data. And in other cases, you sometimes may have to use different annotations that are specific to a particular type, like document. We use two major patterns. One is the template pattern. Here an example from Spring Data using a document-specific template. And the repository pattern. In most applications, uh, they're actually not so different. So it's easy. We will also show that uh, to apply one model and use both of them where necessary. Now, this is an example in Jakarta NoSQL to use CDI with the add inject annotation. That also works with Spring, by the way, although the default one uh, in Spring is usually called different, but uh, you can also use the add inject uh, from the Jakarta annotations standard. And then you have an annotation called database, which defines which type you're using. So for example, column and key value. And then you inject a particular object uh, like the repository. You can also use queries similar to SQL. And there's diversity. Jakarta NoSQL and the Chain NoSQL implementation uh, are probably the most flexible solution here because it combines a common denominator by applying uh, annotations like entity that are common to pretty much every single type of NoSQL database. But then you can combine that with specific annotations. Here we see Cassandra with two examples. And you can also have full text queries. Now let's look at another contender. Micronaut has gained a lot of momentum also against uh, Spring Boot, which was pretty much uh, the most popular and well-known micro framework for a long time. There is Micronaut data and is actually inspired by what we are going to look at afterwards. 
But unfortunately, uh, Micronaut data is currently not yet uh, supporting NoSQL. So you actually have to use the lower level APIs provided by each individual vendor like Neo4j or MongoDB. They plan to support that, uh, but so far it's not yet included. Nevertheless, you can also use the repository pattern. Here it's usually more a declaration and naming. There's hardly an annotation that controls it, unlike most of the other solutions that we saw or that we are still going to see. And you can also have an entity. Again, here without annotations, so you just use a plain text object. But you could use one uh, that you declared for another framework and the annotations would so far simply be ignored. And you can also use query by text here, for example, for Neo4j. Then there's GORM, which is actually the ancestor to Micronaut data because it was created by the same offers. GORM supports NoSQL, but it's a bit similar to Micronaut versus Micronaut data. So there's one uh, flavor of it supporting Hibernate, where you actually uh, map JPA type queries through Hibernate. And there are several others. One is uh, GraphQL and at least three different major NoSQL flavors. Uh, for document-based, you have MongoDB, you have Neo4g, and you have Cassandra, but that's pretty much it. Here's an example. GORM again uh, uses the entity annotation and it defines uh, a static uh, constraints element where it's similar to what Jakarta NoSQL and Chain NoSQL use bean validation for that you can have certain values that are nullable or non-nullable. Oops. Now then let's look at this in the code. So first looking at Jakarta NoSQL uh, to make it a little easier to share and not swap back and forth. Uh, I showed all of them in the slides and now we're going to show the examples uh, up to spring data at once. And then uh, Todoris will show you the spring data examples and slides afterwards. So here we have a repository based application uh, running against Hazelcast. Here, the same for MongoDB. So you see there's very little uh, difference and they're pretty compatible and comparable with each other. The Jakarta examples are all console based, so you don't need a web application. So here you see that the user was found after it was created. And here we get the same with templates. So there's very little difference, uh, except instead of a repository, you would use the template. Then with MongoDB here, we have a repository based example. And the same with a template. Let's 
run one of them. And then last but not least, an example for Neo4j. So here we have relationships. And let's have a brief look at how this actually looks uh, in the Neo4j database. So uh, we have several examples. Uh, one was the God example that I ran earlier. So you see the relation between the Asgardian gods Odin and Thor. And there are others that you may probably not know from the uh, Marvel stories, but uh, there's a stepson of Thor called Ulro, who's the god of hunting. And Ulro has actually a, a step brother who's the biological son of Thor called Magni. So here you see the relation between all of them. Uh, you could also create another relation that Magni would be the grandson of Odin, but uh, that would make the graph a little more complex. So we left that out. Here are the cities for the travel example. And here you see the relations between these travelers. Now let's switch to Postman for the remaining three examples that are running against a web interface. First, uh, let's stay with Neo4j since we already are. So here, uh, these cities are counted. Uh, the Neo4j example on Micronaut uh, simply uses the same city database that you saw. So we have five cities. Now we added a city. Now you actually see that London was added. And the city count goes up to six. We can do the same. And here it's also sharing uh, some objects to some extent. Uh, so we count all the gods in the MongoDB god database. Here we see some of them are duplicates simply because they are shared between different, two different demos. And since we already created Tor, uh, we can find Tor by his name. Now, as we are with MongoDB, the last example is running GORM, where we have a user database that shows all the users that exist. We can also show one user. And now let's create one user. And if we look at the list of all users, you will see that my user was added to the one that already existed. Okay, over to you, Todoris. Yes, yes, Werner. So I'm pretty sure you're uh, 
interested in, in our conclusions, right? However, I don't have uh, that much of uh, good news for you. We are just halfway through the presentation for today. And that actually means that we still have quite some content to cover. With that, let's, go, let's get back to the presentation, right? So Werner already showed us uh, three different approaches or three different aspects of this comparison for today. So let's jump to the spring data for MongoDB. We split this part into two main or two other sub parts, the logistics and the domain. Of course, in the logistics, we will have nothing else other than our basic dependency, which is the Spring Boot Starter Data MongoDB. And why is that? Because we've seen that uh, the majority of users nowadays wants something out of the box without any further configurations, right? And Spring Boot does it well. All you need to do is to add this dependency in your pomxml file. Now, next up is of course uh, the configuration of our database connection. As Werner has already showed you, we do use a simple ensemble uh, mythology database. No rocket science here as well, just two properties about the database's name and the port itself. Now, over to the domain, actually. In the model, we need not, we don't need any further configuration other than our document annotation, right? Where we are just telling the MongoDB dependency or framework of the Spring Boot data, where to look to or where to connect it, uh, where to connect uh, the model to. So here, all we are saying is, hey, this model class is gonna be connected in a collection named gods, because I've already given you in the properties which database I want you to connect to. So in the mythology database, I want you to search for the gods collection. And of course, no more complex configuration in our repository, right? All we need to do is to just extend the Mongo dependency specific or the MongoDB specific repository. So our God repository will just extend the Mongo repository with uh, a type of God a string. You might be wondering at this point, hey, what about the controller though, right? And uh, let's park it for now because I'm pretty sure you will like how uh, the configuration of uh, the controller looks like. So this is it more or less about uh, the D Spring Data MongoDB configuration in a nutshell. And of course, I will show you more uh, during the short demo as Werner did, just for the sake of not uh, switching back and forth to the presentation. So now, what do we see here? Spring data for Neo4j, right? And uh, our Neo4j database normally comes with a moves database by default and out of the box. And that's why we did include that example to our demos as well. So what do we see here? Or how does the movies database that uh, it, uh, which comes together with uh, the new 4 j database, how does it look like? Of course, we do have a movie with uh, several properties like title, release date, and so on. We do have person, a person entity as well, name, uh, born uh, date uh, could be some sample properties as well. And then because we are talking about graph databases, we should have some kind of relationships between the different entities, right? So what we see here is that a person entity is more or less connected to a movie entity or related to a movie entity with this small arrow, which stands for acted in. 
And basically, the way we should read this is that a person has acted in this movie. So, person Tom Hanks has acted in the movie Forrest Gump. Of course, no rocket science here as well. However, what is important to keep in mind at this moment is that there is a simple configuration on the way you could define these relationships. Because when it comes to relationships, you could also have an incoming relationship and so on. So uh, this would be, uh, or a person entity could be an incoming relationship to relation to the movie entity. Same goes for the directed relationship. Now, we'll see more of it during the demo, but for now, let's go through the same approach as we did for the MongoDB and Spring Data. So here we decided for our uh, short demos and examples for today to go for the Spring Data uh, Neo4j RX Spring Boot Starter dependency, of course. And why is that? Because uh, as I have already mentioned, the Spring Boot dependency unties your hands, first of all. And second of all, of course, you see some Rx here, right? Some Rx uh, um, thing in the dependency. What does it stand for? We decided to follow this approach because um, reactive programming, of course, helps us uh, during the uh, back and forth of data to the database, I mean, and uh, from the controllers. Now, Enough about it, uh, no rocket science in the configuration of the database as well. We just need to define a URI because uh, Neo4j runs uh, via a bold driver, of course, of course, and then just a username and a password for our database connection. As we already said, we do have two entities here, right? So the movie entity and the person entity. In the movie entity, we need it. For the movie entity, we also need a movie repository, right? And we see why we will see why we don't need a person repository because our main entity is basically the movie. And then we take care of any other connection using the relationship properties. We will see more about it in the demo as well. And of course, we have some roles uh, of uh, a person uh, of a movie. Now, about the repository. Same as with the MongoDB configuration, right? Mm -hmm. So all we need to do is to just extend the Neo4j specific repository. As you can see, we are just extending here the reactive Neo4j repository. And of course, some reactive uh, way of dealing with uh, a repository or uh, of storing our model, uh, a mono entity. Nothing crazy as well. In Neo4j though, something that, that we need to cover as well, or we need to stress, uh, everything is a node. So a person entity is a node, just like how we did in MongoDB, right? However, termino terminology changes because uh, Neo4j is all about graphs. So that would be all for our model, actually, for Neo4j. All you need to cater for is a node dependency, sorry, a node, anno node annotation on top of your model class. And of course, same goes for the movie entity, just a node annotation, some properties here. And as we already said, the relationship. What, what did we say earlier? That a person has actually directed a movie or acted in a movie. And here's the way we could configure it in the code. So a relationship annotation, which is of type acted in. And as I said earlier, can you still remember? Of, a direct, of an incoming director, right? So we are still in the movie entity. We defined a couple of properties related to the movie, specific to the movie. And then we also need to define somehow the relationship to the person entity. And this is the way we, we could go around it. Same goes for the directors itself. 
because uh, as we said, how are we connecting this entity to the person's entity? By giving this uh, type of map, the person entity and the roles. And of course, about the roles, uh, just a relationship properties annotation, once again, specific to Neo4j. Is it already the third annotation we need to cater for? Pretty simple, right? Uh, not too many annotations uh, we need to cater for. And of course, some very basic configuration for the roles class itself. Now, I will stop sharing the presentation because I would like us to have a quick look, and I hope it is still visible, in our Spring Data MongoDB example, right? So just the very basic uh, main class, and of course, as we've seen already, uh, the God, so uh, the God model class, so with the annotation, some properties, and that would be all. Once again, the interface, nothing crazy. We just need to extend the Mongo repository. And I promise you something, right? What about the controller? How does it look like? Let's have a look at it. Okay, some, some request mappings, some auto wire dependencies, some get mappings. Hey, it doesn't really look like you need to take care of some MongoDB specific configuration, or does it? It doesn't actually. So your controller needs no MongoDB specific configuration. And that's cool, isn't it? So uh, we've already covered our MongoDB example. So in terms of coding at least. So let's see how that plays out in uh, Postman, just like how Werner showed us earlier on for the rest of the examples. So here we have, uh, I have already started everything. Also our, uh, both the databases are already up and running, both MongoDB and Neo4j for the next example. So let's have a look at the very basic get all gods request. What does it return? Of course, it returns um, some very basic uh, data. We initiated our database with, and you see also, uh, uh, how fast it is, right? Of course, uh, the database is the database is not loaded with uh, much data. However, let's have a look at the rest as well. Now, what are we doing with this request? We are basically searching for all gods uh, with a name starting with her. In our example, of course, we have era only, right? As you can see. However, let's say I want to also add one god. That would be Hercules, right? With um, a power of strength. Uh, I didn't follow Werner's approach uh, uh, regarding uh, Marvel uh, heroes. I went for Greek mythology, guess why? <laughs> so let's say I'm gonna add Hercules and uh, he's added. So by the time I'm about to request the database to bring me or to show me all the available gods, I should see a Hercules here, right? At least this is the way it should be. Yes, and we see Hercules was just added. And what does it mean for this request? It means that we should have one extra record being returned here, right? Which is the case, that's really good. So let's say um, I regretted adding Hercules to our database. So I want to delete him right now. So I'm gonna delete by ID. I just copied the ID. And if I just do the same here, if I just try to get all the gods back, uh, I will see no Hercules. And just for the sake of, uh, demonstration, that would be it, right? So this is it more or less for our MongoDB configuration and example. In the meantime, if you have any questions uh, for uh, either one of us, feel free to use the chat function of uh, this session so we can answer all of them after the end of this talk. Now, enough about the Spring Boot 
data MongoDB. Let's have a quick look at the Neo4j example as well. While I'm stopping the MongoDB example, and I'm actually starting the Neo4j example, let's have a look at what we've covered so far in terms of our domain. As we've seen, our domain consists of four classes with the most important one being the movie entity, right? As we said, a note annotation, some properties, and of course, the definition of our relationship, of the relation to the person entity. The person entity is here with just, with just one node annotation. The roles. One more annotation, I'm counting, three annotations so far, right? And our interface, which just needs to extend the Neo4j specific repository. Three annotations and one um, repository specific to the framework itself. Not that much, right? to take care of. So let's see how that plays out in Postman as well. Uh, I see here that our application has already started, but also before diving into the example itself, as Werner did, I also feel it is good to at least have a very basic look, a very quick look at how this sample Neo4j database looks like, right? So as we said, let's have a quick look. Tom Hanks, he comes from the per person entity, right? And of course, you now see the arrows, right? He's acted in the Da Vinci code. And Da Vinci code is a movie entity. You see, incoming. This is how it looks like in uh, the incoming arrow or property looks like. Same goes for uh, Ron Howard, who directed the same movie. Incoming arrow from, sorry, incoming arrow to the movie entity from a role entity. That would be it actually for the sake of having a quick look at the graph database. And now, Let's quickly say, uh, I've already run it once, as you can see, earlier on, but uh, for, for the sake of uh, doing it once again, we will see here a request uh, that returns all the available movies. So the Neo4j database comes out of the box for, for us, uh, containing, of course, a wide variety of movies, I would say, right? Because if we see around 75 movies, that is great for uh, a database to start playing with, at least. Now, one more example would be to fetch a movie by title. And here you see uh, what we've seen or what we haven't seen, right, in the controller. So back to the controller again. And why is that? Because once again, we need no further configuration in the controller. Doesn't this look like just a typical REST controller? No framework specific configuration? Yeah, you got it right, that's it. No framework specific configuration for the controller. So as we've seen here, once again, and sorry for the back and forth, get mapping by title, nothing crazy, just some mono entities here, reactive specific as well to help us with this demo. And now let's say we are searching for the matrix movie, right? Let's see whether it comes back. Yeah, it's here. And we see the title, descriptions, this, sorry, description, actors and roles, directors. And what about deleting a movie? Let's say I want to delete the very last one, right? For the sake of uh, time and demonstration as well. So our last one is a league of their own, right? So 
we're gonna delete movie a movie by title and of course the title is here so let's send this request hopefully we will see nothing here and for the sake of uh, confirming this we should see or we should get 74 records now right 73 um so we just deleted the movie a league of their own same goes for uh the create new movie but let's uh, get back to the presentation also looking at the time so let me just quickly we didn't we didn't cover hibernate ogm did we what happened to it okay so let let's have a look at it i know you might be wondering already what happened to hibernate ogm because uh, it was a main player or at least hibernate was a main player so far so how things uh can be configured how things could be configured for hibernate once again an entity annotation and uh yeah i start disliking it so let's see let's stay a bit patient one too many for our uh, authors this is just a, a very typical um articles example one too many and then cascade persist mapped by editor okay that doesn't look so good okay and then if i want to persist data how could i have entity manager wow i'm start i start getting allergies so what about testing it or uh, seeing how that would be would really look like uh, in real life okay so we are creating an entity manager factory just like the way we were doing in the past a new model a new model class of course an instance of for the editor class and then there is this data entity no i don't wanna see it anymore right uh i'm already getting colored so let's get to the conclusions and why you see me so negative about it uh we'll cover also together as we speak so first of all what are the conclusions or our conclusions at least because i feel it might be an objective view uh towards or against these frameworks so our conclusions for Jakarta NoSQL. First of all, it is still a work in progress. However, it removes boilerplate code and provides a cleaner and more readable DAO. What about the next one? It does support a huge number of NoSQL database systems. And of course, the loosely coupled code makes switching between different NoSQL no SQL vendors, just a matter of configuration. So the only drawback here is that it is still a work in progress. Conclusions about Micronaut. Well, this is also a work in progress, as Werner already mentioned. However, Switching between different NoSQL vendors is not so easy in this particular case. And with that, we also need to mention that Micronaut Data does not support NoSQL databases yet. However, we found, of course, one positive aspect of the framework. It is often uh, faster and with a lower footprint, and of course, it does support languages like Java, Kotlin, and Groovy. So we've seen our conclusions for Jakarta NoSQL, Micronaut. What about GORM? This is the third one. We still have two more after GORM, right? So GORM removes a lot of boilerplate as well. It does provide a cleaner and more readable DAO implementation too. Third one, yeah, once again, a green one, right? So it does work with Grails, Micronaut or Spring Boot. And of course it has Polyglot 
uh, language support for Java and Groovy. However, only three to four of the most popular NoSQL databases are supported out of the box. And of course, that means that others require more effort or they won't even work yet. That would be all for our GORP conclusions. What about our Spring Data conclusions? And of course, you might be wondering why did we add the Spring Boot here? But as I said, uh, it made us forget we were writing NoSQL with a minimum amount of configurations. Everything comes out of the box for us, which means that we have our first advantage. It does remove a lot of boilerplate code. Second positive thing that we've seen in this framework, it does provide a cleaner and more readable DAO implementation once again. Third one, loosely coupled code makes switching between different NoSQL vendors just a matter of configuration. However, only half a dozen of the popular NoSQL databases are supported out of the box, yet others require more effort or will not even work yet. Maybe we were quite negative is the right word to say here about uh, hybrid OGM. However, I feel uh, there is a valid rationality behind it. It is an outdated framework and uh, regarding uh, documentation. And of course, uh, there has been no release since 2018. Now, using a mapper for all scenarios is also not a recommended approach. Third one is that some JPA concepts are not easily mapped to the NoSQL world, for example, transactions. And fourth one, um, it doesn't provide any error safe way to run the query language and hydrate DTOs from the result. Because as I have already stressed so far, this is what we as developers want, an easy way to hydrate DTOs from the result after having run the query language in an error safe way. That will be all about uh, our conclusions. So we've seen Jakarta NoSQL, Micronaut, GORM, Spring Data, and Hibernant OGM. With that, feel free to have a look at our GitHub repository where you can find all the code examples we've showed today. And of course, uh, a link to the project page of the Jakarta NoSQL framework. You can always contribute to that. Both of them are open source as well. You know this already. Um, it is important to also give credit to some uh, entities or people. First of all, to flatitoncom flat, flat uh, for the nice uh, schematics or icons so we could use for free. Next to Michael Simmons, who helped us uh, out with some of the conclusions. And then to Jean Teixeur as well for some GORM related conclusions. That would be all uh, for, from uh, Werner and myself. Have a good one. Same for me, bye.